Brad and Heischer are there. Brad scores! And a first round exit is option B. The New Jersey Devils win a playoff series for the first time in 11 years. I blame you, Paul Bisnet. Everything was better when you were calling us Fugazis. When Biz jumps on your team's bandwagon, abandon all hope. So almost a month ago, the New York Rangers got a lead. Again. They blew a 2-0 series lead. Again. What, you didn't expect the team you spanked in games 1 and 2 to adjust? Thank God for the Bruins this year, because this was not the biggest collapse of the playoffs. But with Boston gone, the East was wide open! And it will haunt Ranger fans for a long time what they could have done if they made it past the first round. If they blew a 2-0 series lead for the second year in a row. But this time they managed to force a Game 7. Just to lay an egg in that one too. But they didn't lose in the Eastern Conference Final to the class of the league this time. They lost in the first round to an inexperienced Devils team. With the star power the Rangers acquired this trade deadline, they were hoping to be like the 2008 Boston Celtics, but ended up closer to being more like the 2013 Brooklyn Nets. Right guys, too old, too late. Last year, despite losing to Tampa Bay, if you were a Ranger fan, you were able to hold your head up high. Nobody expected them to make the run that they did, but they shocked everyone and put themselves on the map. This time, the goal was cup or bust. Especially when you acquire the likes of Vladimir Tarasenko and Patrick Kane. So these results were unacceptable. Obviously, this was an embarrassing way to go out. But as this video goes on, I'm gonna talk you off the ledge a little bit. Things are not as bad as they seem. The window is still open. This team is going to be competitive for a long time. And I'm gonna tell you why. The Rangers are not on the decline. They just kind of plateaued this year. The trajectory can still head back up, as I'll get into in a little bit. But there is a lot to unpack after this series. So let's get into it. When fans of this team wanted David Quinn gone, they didn't buy into it. I was willing to give him another year to figure things out. But then the Tom Wilson incident happened and James Dolan went goblin mode on Jeff Gordon and John Davidson. So we brought in Gerard Gallant despite all the red flags. Something that made me uneasy about hiring Gallant in the first place is the fact that he never made it past his third season in his previous stints. I was willing to be optimistic about him. Maybe he just had some issues with those previous organizations, management. I should have realized it after game six in the Eastern Conference Finals last year when he scratched Capo Caco, but now I definitely see it after the argument that happened with him and Chris Jury that could be heard behind closed doors at the end of game four. I see why his coaching style goes stale. He's a rah-rah kind of guy that can't even get that going for him and offers nothing tactically. Larry Brooks said players were asking for help during their exit interviews. That is unacceptable. His adjustments were just mixing up different lines and hoping things would get going. That's the hockey equivalent of throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. What would you say you do here? You still need structure. When you live and die by your power play, you will die. The power play went cold and to nobody's surprise, the Rangers abysmal 5 on 5 play was the demise of them. You know, Five on five, where a majority of the game takes place under? The Carolina Hurricanes made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, down three of their top players, because they are a team that has a game plan and an ability to adjust to what gets thrown at them. I know he's not a Jack Adams candidate this year, but Rob Brindamore is the best coach in the league. Now, Gallant is out the door. Jury has to make a second coaching change in three seasons. There are two categories you could put the potential hires under. There are the retreads, and then there are the fresh faces. Let's look at the retreads first, or as some guys would like to call them, members of the coaching carousel. I want to quickly start with the guys that they should steer clear of. I already said in the podcast why they should stay as far away from Joel Quinnenville as possible. I don't feel like getting back into that. Besides, he's reportedly not in the running, thankfully. Wait, 
they could be waiting till he gets approved by Gary Bettman at the end of the season. <sighs> Doesn't sound like he's top priority on the list, but the rumors are going to continue. Bruce Brujo? I don't care how much the players from the Canucks liked him and how he got screwed over by the Vancouver organization. The man couldn't get over the hill with a prime Alex Ovechkin. If there's a urinating tree video about a guy, get the hell away. Link to that video in the description. Like Babcock won the Stanley Cup with the Detroit Red Wings. They went on to the Toronto Maple Leafs for some short-term success, only to completely lose touch with his team and be accused of bullying tactics. The guy is a dinosaur. He's out of touch with current players and isn't fit to coach in today's game. And considering the Rangers want to give a guy the task of not just making them an elite contender, but also developing the young guys that have not found themselves yet, that's a major red flag. Stay as far away from Babcock as possible. Now, let's get into a hiring that I think I would be fine with. Initially, I was gung-ho on him. Not so more anymore, but I think he'd be just fine. One of three guys in NHL history to take three different teams to the Stanley Cup Final. Peter Laviolette. This is the retread option that makes the most sense and is arguably the safest choice. Personally, I don't think what happened in Washington was his fault. The Capitals' window is closed, they're old, and suffered a ton of injuries this previous season. Laviolette is a proven Stanley Cup winner in 2006 with the Kings, who preaches an aggressive style of play that leaves room for creativity on offense while maintaining structure in the neutral zone and defensive zone. At the same time, he's been in the league a while, and it's shown that his coaching style goes stale too. It might not go as quickly as Blunt, but he's won on players and staff from previous spots. Also, let's stop with this delusion that Mike Sullivan is available. One, the Penguins gave him an extension that has not even kicked in yet. Two, the Penn's new GM and team president, whoever that may be, would have to be a damn fool to fire him. Three, say if the Rangers somehow did get the Penguins' permission to interview him, and he did agree, even though he said himself he was the same picture, we'd owe the Penguins compensation. Do you really, and I mean really, want to give the Pittsburgh Penguins of all teams assets during a rebuild? Hell no. In my opinion, if you're going to go with the retread, there was only one for sure answer. Barry Trotz. But that window is now shut. If you remember early enough in the season when the Rangers were struggling, management was eyeing that situation closely with Dawn. Trot said in an interview not too long ago that the idea of coaching an original 16 did intrigue him. Then the helmet throw by Jacob Truba happened, and the Rangers did the worst thing they could have done if they wanted Barry Trotz. They started winning. And Gallant played the kids more often at the time, but we'll touch on those guys in a little bit. Then the final nail in that coffin came when Trotz decided to go back to Nashville for a GM role. That takes us into the fresh face category, which is the direction I think the Rangers should go in, in my opinion. Here's why. Since the expansion in 1967, you want to know how many coaches in the NHL won the Stanley Cup with different teams? Only one, Scotty Bowman. At some point, you gotta think to yourself, hey, let's try something new. Experience seems to be very important for the Rangers right now when looking for their new head coach, but that tunnel vision doesn't always help you. Yes, it's a risk to go with a coach that's inexperienced, but champions don't always play it safe. If head coaching experience in the AHL is the main criteria for this coaching search, then this coaching search would have ruled out John Cooper before the Tampa Bay Lightning. They would have ruled out Jared Bednar before the Colorado Avalanche. They would have ruled out Rod Brindamore before the Carolina Hurricanes. This is an area that the Rangers would be taking a chance in with an inexperienced coach. But hey, sometimes the chance is a breath of fresh air. One such example of one of these fresh-faced coaches is Hartford Wolfpack coach Chris Nodlock. Ranger fans might remember this guy for taking over the bench briefly after David Quinn got COVID. They certainly did well in his brief time there. If the Rangers aren't paying attention to their AHL affiliate in Hartford, they're fools. In 2019, Nodlock was hand-selected by then-assistant GM, now current GM, Chris Jury. He's coached a lot of young guys on the Rangers roster as they went through the system. This year, he took a Hartford Wolfpack team that was struggling at the beginning of the year and turned them into one of the hottest teams in the league. Even though the Wolfpack lost a good number of players for NHL playoff recalls, they plowed through the first two rounds of the AHL playoffs to reach the semifinal this season, where they got knocked off by the Hershey Bears. It's as if Nomok's been groomed to one day be behind the home bench at Madison Square Garden. 
Also, before Knobloch came to Hartford, he won championships as head coach in the WHL and the OHL before brief stint as an assistant coach with the Philadelphia Flyers. But obviously, there's more options to consider. The Rangers did get permission to interview Spencer Carberry, assistant coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. After all, he's being looked at at other teams in the league, including the Washington Capitals. Carberry is only 41 years old, the youngest guy on this list, which makes me think he's got plenty of fresh new ideas in him. He has some previous head coaching experience in the ECHL and AHL before being in Toronto for the past two seasons. Definitely worth looking at, but do you wonder if he has the Maple Leafs stink on him? I doubt it considering the Leafs finally got past the first round and their struggles to accomplish that feat were established way before he arrived. Another name that people bring up is Devils assistant coach Andrew Brunette. Brunette took over for Joel Quinnenville in Florida after the whole Kyle Beach situation came to light. He led the Panthers to a President's Trophy that year. But he was an interim and the Panthers ended up going with the more experienced Paul Maurice for this season. So if you look at the Panthers right now, I don't think they're complaining. He became an assistant coach for this young up-and-coming Devils team, who as we said before, beat the Rangers to advance to the second round this year. Unlike some other guys you consider fresh faces, Nutt does have almost a year of NHL coaching experience under his belt, which sets him apart from the more inexperienced guys in the fresh face category. What makes this interesting is not just what Brunette can bring to them. If the Rangers can pry him away from the Devils, it's like they would be severing a limb of their rival. I do not care that he is up for Jack Adams in work this year. It's only a matter of time before the New Jersey Devils realize that Lindy Ruff is not a good coach and then can him to promote Brunette. Next name that's been picking up lately is Jay Leach. Described as an excellent communicator, Leach was the assistant coach for the Seattle Kraken, who came one game shy of the Western Conference Final this year. Leach earned that position after being the bench boss for the Boston Bruins AHL affiliate in Providence. Speaking of Boston, Leach was interviewed by the Bruins for that job, but obviously the Bees went with Jim Montgomery. I wonder if they regret that decision. Well, after the season Seattle just had, Leach definitely had some heads turned in his direction. Finally, let's get into someone in the fresh face category that I don't want. Not that his name really picked up any steam, but you see people want this to happen. I consider this guy to be technically a fresh face because of no head coaching experience, but once you hear this name, you're not going to consider it so fresh. Do not hire Mark Messier as head coach. It's already striking against him that he doesn't even have experience as an assistant coach in this league. Besides, what if it doesn't work out? It was already blasphemy that this organization fired John Davidson. It will be that time's infinity if they fire Moose. Those are the options that coach. You can pretty much guess who my choice would be, but I'll get into that later. Jury seems to be taking his time with this decision. He better be careful. He needs to be absolutely sure this is the right guy, otherwise we're going to have another Gallant situation in a couple of seasons. But despite what I just said about Gallant, I do need to be fair to him. The Rangers lineup was not diverse. They only had one method of attack, just trying to beat the Devils with skill and finesse. Think you can win on talent alone? Gentlemen, you don't have enough talent to win on talent alone. It was like that clip of South Park when Carmen is playing basketball against Kyle. He's trying to do the same move every time and Kyle just defends it the same and it works. Check out this sweet move. Ah, you can't block like that. I'm gonna do something super killer. God damn it, stop it, Kyle. <laughs> Let's just see you get the ball this time. Kyle, knock it off. Gallant's style is straightforward, simplified game that requires more forechecking. Yes, Gallant's lack of tactical adjustments does not help, but even though on paper this might be the most talented Raiders team ever, last year's team was built more for playoff hockey. While the Devils were mostly an inexperienced playoff team, they offered multiple methods of attack. That and they were fast. Yeah, we're about to face one of the youngest, fastest teams in the league. Let's get older and slower. Let me ask you something. Which of these players would have been more beneficial to the Rangers in this playoff? Patrick Kane or say, Tyler Bertuzzi? Jack, are you saying that you'd pick a young role player over a guy who's won the Stanley Cup three times? Obviously, at face value, Kane is the better player. If the two of them were going to play a game of one-on-one -on -one post, everyone would pick Kane to beat Pertuzzi, as I would too. But this is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. 
you have to take into consideration what the team is lacking. I'm looking for the best players, Craig. I'm looking for the right ones. Kane added skill to a lineup that already had a ton of it. I'm not saying Bertuzzi was the guy the Rangers should have gone for at this trade deadline. I'm just using him as an example. But Bertuzzi, being a guy that works hard and does those physical things like create net front presence, would have added something to the Rangers lineup that they were lacking. Chris Kreider can't be the only guy in the lineup to tip deflections and cash in rebounds. Yes, Kane had a bad hit. It hindered his playing ability. That being said, did the Rangers need a player like him? I can't blame Chris Jury for pulling the trigger on that trade, especially because we didn't have to sell the house for him. We didn't even have to sell the house for Tarasenko. But adding players that were heavy on their physical ability and hard work would have given the Rangers more ways to attack their opponents rather than just trying to finesse the opponent each time. Another thing about those acquisitions was that they seemed to fall under the typical Rangers trope of getting a superstar player while he's either over the hill or in the twilight of his career. This is something I talked about ad nauseum in one of my articles for Elite Sports New York. I'll put the link to that in the description. The Rangers have plenty of players that play the finesse and skill style of hockey. The trade for Kane didn't address an area of the game that the Rangers were lacking in. They got him just because they could, which I can't fault them given Kane's track record. But this approach was wildly different from last season's trades. Last season, the Rangers acquired Andrew Kopp and Frank Vitrano. <clears throat> While those two didn't wow you with their skill, like a Patrick Kane would, they were guys that worked hard that were difficult for the opponents to play against, while also putting up points in the process. They helped the Rangers go on a run because they gave the Rangers something they needed. So after the Rangers arguably put too much emphasis on grit last season, they put not enough emphasis on grit going into this postseason, and they ended up suffering for it. Because outside of Jack Hughes, it was not the marquee guys like Jesper Brat or Nico Heischer that hurt the Rangers. It was the Eric Hollas, the Andre Palats, and the other depth players that won't wow you with their scoring ability like Hughes, but play with an intensity that makes playing against them very difficult. After games 1 and 2, Kane and Tarasenko were mostly invisible this postseason. Kane was third on the team in points this postseason with 6, but that's misleading considering he went off in game 2, and was mediocre at best for the rest of the series. We were hoping for Mika Zibanejad to find himself like he did last year. While he gave us a glimmer in Game 6, he was still mostly nowhere to be found. When Game 7 started and he had a 2-on-1 immediately after the opening faceoff, and they didn't even get a shot off, I knew it was going to be bad. That was not a player playing with confidence. Speaking of players that lost confidence in themselves, Artemi Panarin didn't have a 6-game pointless streak at all in his career. That all changed this series. Outside of a Game 7 overtime goal, the Breadman hasn't been getting it done in the playoffs for the Rangers. He's the Blue Shirts' highest paid player with an $11,000,000.6 cap hit. It's gotta be concerning a player being paid that much is not getting it done when it matters most. He's got a full no movement clause, so don't expect him to go anywhere. But you gotta wonder, if this continues next year, Maybe management will want to do with him what Mike Keenan did with Mike Gartner in 1994 and trade him for an established player who comes up big in the postseason, even though Gartner had pretty respectable numbers as a Ranger in the postseason. Adam Fox, 8 points in 7 games, looks impressive, but that Game 7 was the worst of his career. That game was over when he turned the puck over and they allowed that shorthanded goal. Speaking of guys who put up a lot of points but disappointed in Game 6, Chris Kreider was the other Ranger player who was part of that abysmal turnover that basically sealed the deal for the Devils. Kreider was the best forward for the Rangers. He is now the Rangers' all-time leader in playoff goals. He's also tied for first in NHL history alongside Mark Messier for goals when facing elimination. Yes, all-time in NHL history. Despite all that, he couldn't keep it going when it mattered most. It was nice to hear him hold himself accountable after the game, but outside of the turnover, he's the second to last player that the Rangers fans should be concerned about. As far as I'm concerned, only one player showed up for that Game 7. Igor Shesterkin. The fact that Akira Schmid had not one, but two playoff shutouts before Igor does is embarrassing. And it's saying two things. One, it shows how little Schmid was challenged and how bad the Rangers were at creating high danger scoring chances. 
Second, it shows how defensively they left Igor hung out to dry by allowing so many high danger scoring chances. He hasn't played in three weeks, and Igor is still second among goalies in this postseason in goals saved above expected. The kid line, who was our best line in last year's postseason, barely made any presence known this one. Other than Kapokako showing to be a great puck protector, the line was basically missing in action for the series. And the biggest disappointment being Alexi Lafreniere putting up zeros across the board. Jacob Truba? Too little too late to wake the team up with that hit on Timo Meyer in Game 7. By the way, if you're a Devil fan and you think that hit by Truba on Meyer was dirty, never say anything positive about Scott Stevens again. Your booze mean nothing, I've seen what makes you cheer. Long story short, there's blame to go everywhere except in goal. Okay, Jack, you're some random guy on the internet who likes hockey. Clearly there's a shortage of guys like you out there. If you're the GM of this team, what would you do? Well, let's start with the coach. First of all, whoever comes in needs to be a tactician, not someone who just idly sits by and just hopes the players come up with something. That is literally your job as coach, to hold the players accountable. There's a saying, Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. That also being said, the Rangers have the difficult task of not just holding players accountable, but also developing the young guys like Lafreniere, Kako, and so forth. I'm very skeptical this will happen given the Rangers track record. I think they're going to go with Peter Laviolette. They interviewed him too, I think he'd be fine, but here's what I would do. First, promote Chris Knobloch from Hartford and make him the head coach. You know what you're getting from the retread coaches. And while they can provide some success, so far, it always puts the team back in the same position they were before just a few seasons earlier. While some guys seem like a safe option, particularly Laviolette, trends show that unless your last name is Bowman, you're not winning a Stanley Cup behind a different bench than the first one you were behind. The Rangers should take that risk, and I use that word risk very lightly in this situation because this seems like almost a no-brainer in my opinion. Jury brought Knobloch here. Chris has his pulse on the organization. He's coached the likes of young guys like Philip Heedle, Braden Schneider, and so forth. So he's familiar with some of these guys. That's also not taking into consideration how the members on this team from 2021 are familiar with him too. As far as his coaching ability goes, let's add some more context to the Wolfpack's playoff run. We all know the team struggled at the beginning of the year and eventually caught fire before burning out three wins away from the Calder Cup. But that all seems the more impressive when you take into consideration that the Rangers prospect pool isn't ranked very high on many hockey writers' lists. That this should be a relief for fans who are very critical of Gallant's inability to adjust. Where the Wolfpack struggled at the beginning of the season, Nabok didn't just make an adjustment to the team's game plan, he scrapped it for a different approach in which the players thrived under. The Wolfpack went from playing more conservative and sitting back deploying a more aggressive style of hockey and ultimately turn things around for them in the end. So clearly, Knobloch is willing to make changes tactically when necessary. Vince Mercogliano of Loha.com wrote a great article about Knobloch where he goes into detail about his season in Hartford, his background in juniors, his coaching ability, and talks to former players and other individuals he's worked with. I'll put the link to that article in the description of this video as well. I highly suggest you read all of it because after I did, I was ready to run through a brick wall for Knobloch. If Knobloch can take a squad that isn't really thought of for their talent and bring them as far as they went, I'd love to see what he can do with an NHL roster that already has some established talent and some kids that have a high ceiling but are still looking to reach it. And yes, with a first time NHL head coach, you do risk the possibility of the guy not immediately taking them to success, or not even succeeding at all. But when someone in your organization shows you what they have accomplished in the position you put them in, sometimes you have to take that risk. A knock hire would be something drastically different for the Rangers, but it would be a breath of fresh air considering the retreads of John Tortorella, Elaine Vigneault, and Gallant not working out. Could he be the Rangers' own version of John Cooper? I suppose there's only one way to find out, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. Next, let's look at the roster. Well, I'm going to say it might shock you, but I said this on the podcast weeks ago. Keep everything mostly the same. Do not panic. What do I mean by this? Vladimir Tarasenko and Patrick Kane? Let them both walk. Yes, both of them. What is the definition of insanity? 
doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for something different. Don't go back to this old Rangers trope of getting players whose best playing days are behind them. Marc Messier was the exception, not the rule. Madison Square Garden is not a retirement home. Instead, and this might sound crazy considering they haven't put up that many points yet, give Capo Caco, Alexi Lafreniere, maybe even Philip Heedle consistent top six minutes. We look at Jack Hughes and we're dumbfounded. How come Kako and Lafreniere didn't turn out that good? Well, Hughes' skating ability is something that sets him apart from many other players in this league. But here's another thing to consider. When Hughes went to the Devils, they were not in a good spot at all. With little depth, Hughes was in a spot where he could play top six minutes constantly. The Rangers had the luxury of already having some solid depth on their wings when Kako and Lafreniere both started their careers. So their time in the top six was minimal at best. In short, Hughes was allowed to make mistakes. Hughes was allowed to have growing pains and stay in his spot in the lineup. Because that is what young players do. When Lafreniere and Kako make mistakes, they get put on the third line, thus not getting many opportunities to make up for them. Conversely, this is a very similar situation Kako and Hughes faced at Worlds in the year they were drafted. But there, it was Kako getting the playing time, while Hughes wasn't because he was on the team of stars. Maybe in hindsight, a year or two in Hartford would have been better for a lot from Kaka. But because of their draft status, they were put on this team, and not necessarily given the minutes they should have been given in the first place. But, give them goals to set out for this season. Mandate that the two of them get 20 goals and or 60 points or more. If you look at their numbers from this previous season and saw what they put up with mostly third line minutes, I'd say it's definitely doable. While the two of them and Heedles have definitely showed some good moments together in the third line, they still don't get much playing time compared to their top six counterparts. If they were to get so much as power play time, it would be on the second line with less than a minute to go in the man advantage. They're not going to grow if you don't give them chances to grow. So the kids, Wap and Kako in particular, put them in the top six. And if one of them makes a mistake, keep them up there. Help them through it. Let them learn from their mistakes so that when they're in those situations again, they'll handle it better next time. Don't worry about how that could potentially affect your playoff status. As long as Igor is in goal, you have a chance. And yes, this Rangers team is talented to go back to the playoffs this upcoming season. Kako even said in his interview on Breakup Day that he's starving to play the top six in the power play. While he still has some areas in his game that he needs to work on, he's shown in Sprouts that he is talented enough to play up there. Something people also forget about Kako is that he's six foot two, but he's a gentle giant. He needs to patch his hula hand in this life. Where's your killer instinct, son? You gotta get angry. You gotta get mean. That's the only way you can play. Waff definitely needs to work on his skating this off season, but he was a consensus overall pick in his draft for a reason. Have some patience. Rangers fans have wanted the young guys to get these opportunities for a while now. And if they get it, the majority of the fan base will rejoice. Hey, finally! That's what we've been waiting for! A majority of the fan base would be like that, but you still got the faction that are ready to trade them. First off, what do you expect to get for either one of them, given this team's cap situation? Because of the cap situation, the Rangers are kind of stuck in this situation. Second, there are plenty of examples of guys being late bloomers. Just look at Teach Thompson in Buffalo, or Adrian Kempe in Los Angeles. Third, you risk sellers regret. Our boy Mika Zibanejad. Do you think the Ottawa Senators regret trading him? I thought so. Hell, I heard Pierre Maguire in an interview on the Blue Crew, Johnny Lazarus, saying when he was a boy, he saw the papers basically crucifying this one young player of the Canadians at the time. You want to know who that young player was they were going after? Guy Lafleur. So no, don't give up on these kids just yet. Give Lafreniere as well as Keontre Miller a bridge deal to show their worth. They're kids. The kids are not regressing. Their point total each season so far has risen, and they need to be put in positions where they can succeed, even if it means they make some mistakes along the way. I'm not giving up on you. You don't understand this yet, but people need you. So let's get back to work. Also, to go back on what I said before about this team's salary cap situation, 
Don't expect any big free agent splashes. Not unless they trade Barkley Goodrow. Ironic. The Rangers need more hardworking players, but they'll likely have to trade one of the few they have because he's making too much money. One name comes to mind as far as unrestricted free agents go. Who was on the opposite wing of Panarin when he was a Hart Trophy candidate? Jesper Faust. Who continued to be a notable player for the Carolina Hurricanes? Jesper Faust. Who was an unrestricted free agent on July 1st, 2023? Jesper Faust. Faust is a guy that puts in a lot of hard work and that obviously complements a guy like Panarin's skill. Maybe that can get the Breadman going again? I would absolutely welcome a Jesper Foss reunion to this team as long as it doesn't keep Laf or Kafko out of the top six, which could potentially screw that up. But I don't think the Rangers necessarily have to go that route to find one of these hardworking players that are difficult to play against. See, they got a kid in their system by the name of Brendan Othman. Sit back and relax. I want to spend some time on this kid. He is the first pick Chris Drury made as GM of this team. If the Rangers need a guy who will be a relentless forechecker, who will play the bottom, who's willing to work hard while also being a threat on the score sheet, look no further than Hoffman. I say he has the potential to be a Matthew Kuchuk kind of player. He's a strong kid, as we saw in the preseason game versus the Islanders. He always plays at a fast pace, has great physical presence, makes the defense's lives a living hell, and has a great shot to boot. That, and he agitates his opponents like the menace of society you'd like him to be even earning a spot on Team Canada's World Junior teams the past three years where he averaged a point a game or close to it each time. Last season in the OHL, Offman put up 50 goals and 97 points in 66 games. This season he didn't quite put up those numbers, being traded from the fun Firebirds and Peterborough Peets, but Offman still managed to average over a point a game with 67 in 50 games and was a huge part of the Peterborough Peets win in the OHL Finals against the London Knights. In 23 playoff games, Othman put up 8 goals and 17 assists for a total of 25 points. Now, we wait to see what he can do in the Memorial Cup. I know I said Lafreniere and Kako should have probably gotten a year in Hartford to develop. It's more likely than not that Othman will start next season in Hartford, given there being no clear path in the lineup yet. But honestly, I don't think a year on the third line will hurt him. Starting him with the Wolfpack next year isn't a bad idea, but he should be in New York this upcoming season. Then the year after, for 2024-25, if he needs more playing time to develop, you can always send him to the Wolfpack then, and reevaluate the top six when the time comes. If that's the case, don't expect Offman to be a Vitaly Krasov, given his character and attitude. Let's take a look to the 2022 World Juniors. While Offman got six points in seven games, helping Team Canada win another goal, his role on the team was limited given he was also kept on the fourth line during a good duration of the tournament. While some players you would expect some young, immature guys to voice their frustrations in that scenario, here's what Offman had to say. I know the tournament didn't go as planned for me, but given the role I was in, I embraced it. I was able to show people in the hockey world another side of my hockey play, which is physical and chirpy. I know some people don't like the chirpy side, but it's a side that I carry along with my scoring ability. He was so good in that role that one of the players on the opposing side was ready to fight him in the handshake line. When I hear that response from Offman, that doesn't sound like the attitude of a kid who feels entitled to playing time. That sounds like the character of a guy who wants his team to win and willing to help in whatever way he can. He also said that uh, he didn't like the head, so I don't know. Uh, if you can't play with the big boys, then uh, don't come out. Also, just throwing this out there. Othman's line mate in Peterborough, Avery Hayes, also had a great postseason with the Peets. He wasn't drafted by anyone. I'm just saying, Chris Drury. Another prospect that Ranger fans might remember from four games this year is Will Cooley. The Rangers' second round pick of the 2020 draft. And some people will think of him as the Tom Wilson prototype. In the 2022 OHL season with the Windsor Spitfires, Cooley put up 43 goals and 80 points in 59 games. This year, he played under Knock Block in Hartford, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, putting up 25 goals, 45 points in 69 games. Certainly not flashy, but it's not solely the point production that makes Cooley impressive. It's his physical ability and being one of those big guys that are difficult for defenders to play against. Cooley certainly never shied away from the Tom Wilson comparisons, saying he models his game after the Capitals agitator even saying in an interview he wants to bring the same type of nastiness to his game. 
The Rangers need to welcome that with open arms. Hoffman and Cooley should be the guys that come to this team next year and light a spark that not many people saw coming. The same way that guys like Dennis Rodman and John Sally did for the Detroit Pistons back in 1986. Or to stay in hockey, more so how Brian Russ and Jim Getzel meanly made impact for the Penguins once they arrived. Once both of them find their game, these guys should be centered by either Heedle or Trocheck. And they should be the Rangers' hardworking and gritty line that is going to be difficult for opponents to play against. And not only wear out opponents physically and mentally, but be able to put points on the board as well. Drury initially set up to beef the Rangers' lineup when he took over. This is how you do it. He forgot about that this year with the Kane trade. But it's not too late to go back to that mindset. You know what? It just clicked as I was writing this episode. Often, and potentially coolly, show me why Ranger fans loved Sean Avery so much. I didn't quite get Avery at first. Then years later, I realized something. What Avery gave this team was a backbone. Something they really hadn't had other than a few occasions in their 97 year existence. The Rangers always tried to present themselves as this classy team that wins games the right way, plays with dignity, etc, etc. But that attitude only got them one cup since World War II. That one cup in 94, when I was just a month and a half, it's not a coincidence that at the time they had Mark Messe and notorious pest, Essatikanen. But to get back on Avery, Offman has the potential to be the Rangers' best point-producing player with a huge I'm such a fucking asshole factor to his game since Avery, but with a higher ceiling. Players like him are hard to find, which is why the Kachuk trade worked out so beautifully for the Florida Panthers. Those guys give your team a backbone to stand up for themselves while also standing up for their teammates and hurting their opponents where it hurts the most, too. The scoreboard. Am I saying become the dirtiest team in the league? No. But become a team that is willing to be mean and half fans of opposing teams have a valid reason to hate you. Elliot Friedman said on a recent episode of his 32 Thoughts podcast. I know a lot of people don't like hearing this. You know, choir boys do not win the Stanley Cup. You can be a really nice and decent person off the ice, but in the Stanley Cup playoffs, you have to have a team full of pricks. He was referring to the Leafs there, but it applies perfectly to the Blue Shirts. So yeah, that's what I think the Rangers should do. They're still young, unlike Boston and Tampa Bay. Your window is still wide open. Obviously, Igor is number one in goal, but here's how I do the rest of the lineup. First line, Kreider, Zabanejad, and Kako, followed by Panarin, Trocek, Lafreniere. Third line, you put Offman on one wing, centered by Hedl, and Jimmy VC on the other wing. VC can be the veteran that Offman can lean on. Unless Offman is averaging a point a game, do not take Lafreniere or Kako out of the top six. Finally, on the fourth line, this is assuming that trade Barkley Goodrow, Will Cooley on one wing, Johnny Brodzinski at center, and Tyler Mott on the other wing. Once, or if, Cooley can turn his physical presence into points, then move him up to the other wing alongside Offman to be the Rangers' most physical line. On defense, run it back. Fox and Lundgren one, Bill and Trouba second, Schneider with the bargain bin free agent, or take a chance on Zach Jones on the third. If you give that lineup time to find themselves, this could be a very well-balanced lineup for the Rangers that has skill to complement strength, which could diversify the Rangers' attack and give the defense hell because the Rangers will have an answer for everything. Could you expect a cup run with this team? I'd say not yet. But with Igor and goal, anything is possible. I don't expect 2024 to be the year the Rangers win the cup. I'd say this is the year the Rangers take a small step back, take a deep breath, and find themselves again. Remember the team they initially set out to be. I'd say this team is definitely talented enough to go back to the postseason, but at most they'll win a playoff series, nothing more. But that's okay. It's time for another year of trial and error. They'll have the Vesna caliber goalie in goal. They'll have the vets at the top of the lineup to keep them in the standings, but need to have the kids alongside them consistently in order for them to grow and be as good as they are heading into the next season. It would be nice to have some young, fresh faces in the top six of this lineup consistently, which is what they should have stuck with this entire time, rather than go with the one-hipped dinosaur in Kane. God help me if they resign him. He'd definitely be cheaper than Tarasenko. I'm going to go as far as to say this. 
Time for the hottest take I've ever had for this stupid podcast. The New York Rangers will win the Stanley Cup in 2025. That is how they will grow, and that is how they'll become the great players we want them to be when we drafted them. Then, heading into the next year, they'll show their full potential for a whole season and show why they were selected first and second overall in their respective drafts. I'm not sure how to end this video. So here's a speech by the Rock and Gridiron Gang that I put some Rangers faces and some other stupid edits in. But I think what he says is absolutely relatable to what the team and fans are all feeling the past few weeks. All right, come on, bring it in. Off the bench, come on, come here. Everybody, off the benches, come take a knee. We made a lot of mistakes out there today, all of us. Me too. No shit. They were ready. Let me tell you something else. I still don't believe that they're four points better than you. I still don't believe that they're the better team. I would not trade you for them. Once you hold your heads up high, we're just going to have to work harder. New York Rangers, 2025 Stanley Cup champions. We'll see how well this ages. Thank you very much for listening. If you like what you heard, please like and share with all your friends. If you didn't like what you heard, well, I thank you very much for listening this far. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Funs Podcast and on Facebook at Fat Athletic Nurse Talking Sports. This is Jack Knife. This is another episode of The Cutting Edge. Have a wonderful night.